Good evening, family of the Most High God. Good evening. Welcome to our prayer session. Glory be to God. We thank the Lord who cares for us, who loves us, and blesses us mightily in Jesus Christ's mighty name. Let us pray, Father Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for another opportunity to receive a waiting season, a waiting time, word of empowerment. We look forward to having our minds filled with revelation knowledge, being impacted by the power behind the word, and moving into seasons where we are transformed into better visions of ourselves, powerful visions of ourselves, and successful visions of ourselves. Thank you, Lord Jehovah, for this moment that we receive this important word. And Father, where we have messed up, we ask you to forgive us of our sins. We ask you to renew our minds and put us in a position of righteousness where we are able to stand up and resist the enemy and live holy lives in Jesus Christ's mighty name. We pray. Thank you, Father Lord. Amen. Yesterday we had a teaching that spoke of the importance of having the right mindset. The wrong mindset can be the inhibitor that makes you miss out on what Jehovah has for you. We were told yesterday that the children of Israel had been conditioned for slavitude and they were not in a place to accept what Jehovah had for them, especially in terms of choosing to trust him in the face of danger. They were conditioned for slavitude and their option in the face of danger was to run back to Egypt and not possess the gifts that Jehovah had for them. So we are today continuing with teachings that have to impact our minds, change our mindset. We are starting on a teaching called the Kingdom Mindset to equip us to do what is expected of us. And I'm very grateful to the Lord for giving us this teaching because it's going to change how we think, how we act, how we operate. Because under the kingdom mindset, we have a whole different set of rules of operation than we thought as religious people. So glory be to God, we have this teaching. The first thing that we might want to recognize is we are supposed to live in a kingdom. Christ says, go and preach the word that tells us that the kingdom of heaven has come. So if it's a kingdom, then when did it become a religion? That's my first question. Because Christ did not say, go and teach them my religion. He said, go and tell them that the kingdom of heaven has come. So that should make us start thinking properly. What is a kingdom? So that we can understand how we're supposed to operate. Well, a kingdom is a sovereign rulership that impacts a territory. You know, it's a sovereign rulership that impacts a territory. There has to be the will of the king, the purpose of the king, and the intent of the king impacted onto that territory. Which means... When Christ says, we're supposed to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. He's not saying thy religion come. Say thy kingdom come. So we have had this all mixed up because we think we have a religion when in fact we have a kingdom. We are supposed to look at ourselves as citizens of a kingdom. We are supposed to be what? Impacted by the rulership of a sovereign, mighty God so that his will on our lives gets to be impacted. The purpose of our king gets to be experienced. His intentions on earth get to be felt. That's how we're supposed to be looking at this. And I think us missing that idea makes us you know, mix up things. Because if it's a kingdom, then there's a government. There has to be a ruler who has an army and resources and citizens. Now we have Jehovah 
is the head of the government of our kingdom. And he chose to do something special. He gave one of his kingdoms to the rulership of his children. So by descent, the father is the sovereign ruler. We are ruling on his behalf, which means the will of the Lord should be impacted in our lives. The intentions of Jehovah for earth should be what we are seeing. Not the intentions of the enemy, but the intentions of Jehovah. What does Jehovah want with us want on earth? What does he want to happen on earth is what we should be experiencing. So we want to see the will of Jehovah manifesting on earth. The purpose of the earth according to Jehovah's eyes manifesting the intention of Jehovah concerning everything on earth manifesting. That's why Christ told us to what? To repent because the kingdom of heaven has come near you. I repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near you. He's not saying I repent for a new religion has come. No, they were religious leaders. The Sanhedrin. He's saying, no, I'm bringing a kingdom to you, not a new religion. I'm bringing what? A kingdom. There is a government that is going to start ruling you. And what the government wants is what's supposed to be happening. And we were missing that part. We're missing that because we are thinking, well, um, we can do certain things here on earth and tell Jehovah to do what we want him to do. There is the will of the Lord, which means Jehovah only answers a prayer according to his will, according to what he intended to happen on earth. That's why if you ask a prayer outside his will, it's not going to happen because it's not under the mandate of the government to do those things. The government of Jehovah has got a set of rules, the limitations that Jehovah spoke as this is what can happen here on earth. Like what we were told yesterday, for you to have dominion on earth, you should have what? A clay vessel to live in. If you don't have a clay vessel, you can't have dominion. The one who has authority is the one who has a vessel to stay in. That's why you can kick out a demon from anyone wherever there, because you have the dominion because of where you are. So the set of rules, the intentions of Jehovah on earth get to be what we respect, not the intentions of the kingdom of darkness, but for Jehovah. So what we need to understand is the kingdom has to impact us. Let, let's look at what happened with, with countries that were colonized by, let's say, Britain. There is a queen in England. Queen Elizabeth, and the territories that England colonized, they were taught to speak what? The Queen's language, English. They were taught to dress like what? Like, like the Queen. We were wearing our skin hides, but we were taught to put on shorts, shirts, jackets, and a tie. Our summers are so hot that we don't need ties at all because it's already very hot and something else to close the corner doesn't it? what the queen dressing lifestyle whatever it is that is in england was put onto us it's cold in in england even the summers the hot summers are short and then the very long period is also cold so it's no more for you to have a car but we are there at 38 degrees celsius with the time because the queen's intentions are being impacted on us and they brought in laws of ownership. We were living with the joys of having our little subsistence farming, little area to stay, where I put in my few crops, and where we put the livestock, everyone can put in. And then in England, there was an ownership system that was there. So we found ourselves in a place where our country gets to be divided among the farmers. And if your cattle are found in my fence, we have a problem. But on our case, before the queen came to Africa, we would share the land. You bring your cattle, you bring your goods. We share the pastures. 
Under the Queen's laws, no, their pastures demarcated for certain individuals. We didn't have that one. And that became what we adopted. That's why you find if you go to countries that are colonized by the British, they love their tea. They drink a lot of tea, not coffee. If you go to the Western countries where they're colonized by countries that love coffee, there's more of coffee than anything else. They came and put in certain laws concerning rulership. Somebody who gets to sit in authority in an African territory reporting to the queen. That's how we were positioned by Jehovah. To be ruling on earth on behalf of Jehovah. Zimbabwe is Zambia. Where under his majesty's rule, there were individual rulers within those countries reporting to the queen. So we are supposed to look at it from that perspective. Because if you are in a religion, then you are supposed to do what people in religion do. And it's not about authority because we are supposed to understand that we are supposed to exercise authority. We've been given authority that we are not exercising because we think we're in a religion. In fact, we are in a kingdom, we have a government to report to. So we don't understand what's about. There has to be the will of the Lord in what we are doing. The purpose that Job wants the earth to be and his intention for earth has to be seen with us upholding those things. You know, when we go to Genesis chapter 126, we see Jehovah doing what? Blessing the children giving them dominion, giving them the power to rule. So as long as we think you are in a religion, all your responsibility is what? Pray, please God, and He will answer your prayer. When in fact, you are in a kingdom, in a kingdom with different things. We have rights of citizens. That's why the Bible says what? You're given rights to become what? As long as men as are led by the Holy Spirit, they are what? Called what? And all those that believe in his name, they were given what? The rights. Why did the Bible say rights? Because it's a kingdom. If you are adopted into the kingdom, you get to have the rights of that, that kingdom. If they are giving citizens certain things that they require, you have the rights to receive from the king. What to be. That's why we are wired wrong in the sense of what we're supposed to be doing. So we are supposed to understand what Christ came to do. Christ came to give what? To bring the kingdom of heaven on earth. Heaven is a kingdom. And the influence of heaven should be extended onto the earth. And on earth, the only people who are allowed to operate with the power and authority of heaven are the ones that are created in the likeness of Jehovah, image and likeness of Jehovah, living in a clay vessel. Those are the ones who can have dominion on earth. And we have not understood what dominion meant and why we are in a unique position. As a born again Christian, you are in a unique position to be a representative of Jehovah's interest on earth. That's why he wants you to know about the kingdom. That's why Christ says, go and teach them what I've taught you. What did Christ teach the disciples? Things of the kingdom of heaven. You listen to Christ preaching. The kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom, why was he so always saying the kingdom? He said the religion of heaven is like. No, he said the kingdom of heaven is like a man who did. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who took something. The kingdom of heaven is like. Why? Because we are missing this. Christ said go and teach them concerning what? The kingdom. Not the religion. You see? So Christ brings a kingdom. You no, know, Christ came to give us authority over a territory. So if you receive the Spirit of the Lord, you are expected to exercise the dominion that Christ gave you on earth, and you get to do the will of the Father on earth, so that whatever Jehovah intends to happen, you get to happen. Because you've been licensed to have dominion here on earth, you get to do what needs to be done, and where you are weak, you are expected to talk to the ruler. We need more soldiers to come and fight the demons. And when that happens, when you pray, you are giving what? 
the license for the king to come and exercise authority and interfere in the affairs of that territory that you are in. And his will gets to be what? To be upheld. So we are missing all these things because we've been taught we are in a religion. The people who challenged Christ so much were not sinners. They were religious leaders. They could not understand what was happening. Christ comes and tells you, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come. But the religious leaders saying what? Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't drink in a cup like this. Don't eat before you wash your hands. They had a don't, don't, don't. But Christ comes and says, we have a kingdom to rule here. It's not about separation. It's about infiltrating and extending the influence of the Lord. So go and make disciples of all nations. Go and increase the dominion of Jehovah. That's the mission. Not to keep seclusion where you're saying, these are Gentiles, keep them away. No, we want everyone to join in the kingdom so that the influence of heaven gets to be extended. We are missing the point. We are supposed to operate as Christ came to operate. Jehovah says to Abraham, through your seed the whole world will be blessed. Why? Because Jehovah was not dealing with religion. Jehovah was dealing with the kingdom. So he is setting up a kingdom. So he picks a bloodline that he will start impacting earth through that bloodline, a bloodline that knows about Jehovah. That's why the package that came to Abraham contained, contained also him teaching his children the ways of the Lord because they were supposed to work with Jehovah. That's why there's a difference. You see, religious leaders, they are more about control. You do this, you do that, uh, these ones are allowed. Those ones are not. But kingdom business is all about extending. That's why, you see, if there was no abolition of colonialism, Britain was extending authority all over to new territories. They were in India, they were in Australia, they were in Africa, extending what? They were in America, extending what? Their influence because that's a kingdom mindset. It's not about separation, it's about infiltrating areas where the influence is not. And we are missing all that. That's why we are given what? Dominion, power, authority to impact a location that we are in. That's why we have, you know, uh, a lot of churches being built around. And the more churches there are, the more criminals there are. Because the message is different. You see, if you are in a kingdom, you are extending the influence of the kingdom that where we can benefit things, we don't steal. But religion says, if you steal, you stay out. It's a place for them that save the Lord. That's why you find if you go in a church, in, in certain churches, certain things you can't partake in. You can't drink the blood of Christ. You can't eat the blood of Christ because you're an outsider. That's religion. Kingdom business says, you come as you are, eat my blood. You see, we are missing everything. We are missing everything because we are all about separation. We are. Although we are in the world, we are not of the world. Why? Because we are supposed to extend the influence of heaven on earth. We think that message means separation. We are unique. We keep the uniqueness to ourselves. No. We are supposed to make disciples of all nations. Bring more to Jehovah. Bring them to understand who Jehovah is. Glory be to God. We are supposed to understand why we are here. That's why when Christ came, Christ came to do something very special. You see, He came to die for us. You see, He came to die for us. Why did he need to die? That would be another question. Because death, one way or the other, we have experienced death and it's, it's not something to look forward to. It's, it's painful. It's, it's, it's something that, you know, if we could avoid, we would want to avoid it. You see, 
There was a curse of death that was spoken by Jehovah. The curse of death. Somebody had to die if there was disobedience. Somebody had to die if there was disobedience. So that's why we see, you see, Christ died for what? For one sin. Sin of what? Disobedience. You understand? He died for the sin of disobedience. And disobedience basically means what? Missing the mark. Doing what's not expected of you. Rebelling. So Christ came to die for the sin of rebellion. He didn't die for sins, but the sin of rebellion. Glory be to God. You see, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 to 18, Jehovah gives Adam the rules. You can eat of all these fruits, except, but if you eat, you shall what? You shall surely die. You can eat of all the other fruits. Except the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That tree, if you eat, you shall what? You shall surely die. So, we see the enemy is not in the picture yet. And Jehovah speaks about death. Jehovah creates death. It's not the devil created death. Jehovah creates death. But he does something special about it. He creates death that is lifeless. Death that doesn't have power. Because as long as you are obedient, death doesn't touch you. But if you activate death by disobedience, you get to die. You see? It's not the devil who made this law. As long as you eat all the other fruits and living the one that you're not supposed to eat, death has nothing to do with you. He cannot do anything to you. But the moment you eat from that tree, you what? You shall surely die. So there was no Satan in this statement. There was no devil in this. There was no demons in this. There was no darkness involved in this. It was Jehovah speaking death into existence. To restrain Adam from doing what he was supposed to do. Because death can kill you if you are obedient. That was the situation. In this in obedience, death can kill you. In disobedience, you shall surely die. What does surely die means? I will have to make sure that you die if you do obey me. I need to make sure you die because surely means there is no option otherwise. You have to die if you are disobedient. So, death did not exist before it could. It was there, it was lifeless, but couldn't kill anyone. Could not do anything. Jehovah is the one who brought death into the picture. Not to kill everyone, but if you activate death, it goes on a rampage. That's the problem. It's like a wild animal. It goes on a rampage. The power of death came from disobedience. The power of death came from disobedience. Because we know Jehovah created everything. So if you are disobedient, then you are giving death the power to operate in your life. You are giving death a green light to kill you. Out of disobedience. But if you are obedient, then death has no power to kill. You are safe. So we need to understand that you know, when Christ came, he came to deal with that because Adam and Eve messed up the leadership that they do have. They had dominion on earth as given by the Lord. They were rulers on earth, ruling on behalf of the Father in heaven. It was a kingdom of Jehovah that they were managing. And through disobedience they died. And the spiritually dead individuals could not run the kingdom of the Father. So Jesus came and died. Because somebody had to die. According to Jehovah. Disobedience should result in death. So Christ had to, to die. 
Adam sinned and there was supposed to be a sureship of death and Christ had to die to avoid us dying. So Christ died for what? Reason number one, to be substitution for us. He dies on our behalf. Something had to die and Christ had to die on our behalf. Yes, over time the children of Israel had been killing goats and cows on their behalf so that they do not die. But there was a time that Jehovah wanted to deal with the whole story of sacrifice so that it gets to be done. So Christ became the what? The substitution for us. But there was a problem because Christ is spirit and spirit could not die. He had to get a body to die in. Because there was a need for what? For blood. So he comes and possesses a body given to him or prepared by the father in Mother Mary. And there gets to be what? Flesh that can die. So we were not supposed to die according to the plan of Christ. We are not supposed to die because he get to be the substitution for us. So God needed blood and Christ said to come and live in a body that has blood in it so that when the flesh dies, some that's supposed to die gets to die. And glory be to God. We are in a good place. Something that we need to understand is the confusion that is there between dying in Christ and dying without the knowledge of Christ. When you die without Christ, you will go into an eternal death. But if you die in Christ, you go to get what? Eternal life. Dying without Christ brings eternal death. Dying with Christ means eternal life. And this variation is very big because we know in eternal death the fire never quenches, the worms never die, and there's gnashing of teeth, which means there's continuous suffering all the way through in eternal death. We think, no, when we get to, if you die in sin, you get to burn and burn up. No, you don't die. You see, you don't get to be burned up. You get to be burned continuously. And the homes can get to continuously eat you. And you get to gnash your teeth continuously. And that's a bad place to be. So Christ came to make sure that that does not happen. You know. One thing that we need to understand is you know, there are kind of three kinds of death that there is. Death when the Holy Spirit leaves you. Death when you leave the presence of the Lord. Death when your spirit leaves your body, three kinds of death. So we see a situation where the kind of death that was supposed to be in us was supposed to be what? The death where you lose the Holy Spirit. The death where we leave the presence of the Lord. The death where the spirit gets to leave the body. And Christ said to deal with all those kind of death for us to be saved. So we see Christ praying. No. May this come pass away because there is the death of the flesh that is painful. Where the body gets to die. There is the death where the Holy Spirit lives. That's why Christ says, Why have you forsaken me on the cross? My God, my God. Because the Holy Spirit had to live here to do second death and he had to die the death that everyone else dies he had to take the sin of disobedience Christ had to do the exact death that would have gone through a substitution to restore us into the kingdom that we're supposed to and good Friday all that's going to happen so where we are right now we are supposed to understand something. We are not in a religion. We are in a kingdom. Which means with this revelation we need to rename our group. We are supposed to be children of the Lord. We are supposed to be priests. Supposed to be kings. 
We are supposed to have titles that have to do with the hierarchy of the kingdom where we stay. We can't be religious individuals, no, Christians. Because religion makes you comfortable with poverty. Makes you comfortable with sickness. Because you need to do something to appease Jehovah to come and do something for you. And until certain things are made, I can't really, you know, there are a lot of rules that we do have around religion. I want you to understand this. We call ourselves Christians, but not any place did Christ call us Christians. The name Christian is actually a term that was given to us by pagans who could not identify with us. We don't hear Peter talking about it. We don't hear James talking about it. We don't hear John talk about it. We hear Paul speaking about it twice. When he is in a pagan kingdom where they don't understand who he is and he calls them. But Christ never called us Christians. This was a term introduced to us by pagans who could not identify with us. So, from this perspective, I want to have a title that goes with where I am in the kingdom of because we are called what? Sons of God. That's how what we are called. As men as are led by the Holy Spirit, they are called what? Sons of God. As men as believe in them, he gave them the right to become what? Sons of God. Not Christian, but sons of God. We have been made it what? Kings into priests. That's what we're supposed to be looking at. If we are Christians, then we belong to some religious group where we need to do things that appease the gods. That's religion. But if I am a citizen of the kingdom of the Lord, I have what? Legal right to be in the kingdom. That's why being told that if you believe in the name of Christ, you've given the right to become a child of God. I'm qualified to become a child of God. In the kingdom, provision is based on merit, not on appeasing Jehovah. We have been put in a mindset where we are conditioned to do things to please the Lord so that he can give us things. That's religion. We are in a kingdom, and in a kingdom, we have rights to receive things. Seek if it's the kingdom of the Lord and his righteousness. And all of these things, you get qualified by seeking the kingdom and the righteousness. And after qualification, you what? You receive all of these things that are available for them, that have the right to call themselves children of the Lord. So we need to come to the place where we understand our position. We are not in a religion. The Romans... The religion, the Greeks had a religion, Herodians, Assyrians, Babylonians had religion, but we are in a kingdom. They were not atheists, they were pagans because they believed in other gods. That's why we are not supposed to accept us being called a religion, being put out amongst Buddhists, amongst Muslims, amongst, you know, all those other religions that are there. We are in a kingdom and that's how it's supposed to be looked at. We are children of the Most High God. So today we want to change the mindset that we had. A mindset of religion, a mindset of kingdom. You are in a kingdom, which means modus operandi has changed from singing and grouping in a group and then we accept it, then we go home. We have done and we've done the, what's supposed to be done to appease the Lord. No, no, we are in a kingdom. There are certain things you are expected to do in a kingdom because there are laws that are supposed to do. And if you satisfy those laws, you get to receive what's supposed to receive. If you do A, B, C, D, you get to receive. It's not an appeasing thing. There's a law that is obeyed, which the ruler also obeys. So we need to be in that place where we understand how we're supposed to operate. That's why when Christ was here, they could not position him. When they see him, they, they would ask, who are you? They couldn't put him because he was not among the Jewish leaders. He was not among the other religious leaders that were there. 
You are not part of that dream, but he had authority. So they're asking, who are you? Who gives you this authority? Because we, the religious leaders, don't give you the authority. The Romans don't give you any authority. Who are you? Who gave you the authority? And Christ says to, what does he say? The son of the living God. And we're supposed to be imitators of Christ. So when did we stop being children of the Lord to Christians? We are supposed to be children of the Lord and operate as children of the Lord, as imitators of Christ, because we are part of the body of Christ. Not part of the body of Christians, body of Christ. So we are supposed to think like children of the Lord, citizens of the kingdom of heaven, with rights to receive. The so Christ said, say, I came so that you can have what? A life in abundance, full and overflow. How? By merit. You are qualified to receive A, B, C, D when you've done this. In a kingdom, you have to rise through the ranks. You become a general. From being an ordinary soldier, you are promoted on merit. David goes and fights Goliath. He becomes a soldier. Then he gets to do marvelous things in war. He becomes a general. That's how it's supposed to be. There's to be merits. That's so we don't understand that there's promotion in the kingdom of the Lord. That's why if it's in a religion, we are in a religion where all of us are the same. There's no need to do what's supposed to be done. There's no need to obey the laws. We can go and sing and appease the Lord, appease the God. We give you money and he's happy with us even if we do not obey his laws. That's the all wrong way to deal with it. Because we do not understand that there's promotion within a government. That's why we're missing it. We are living in poverty because we think we need to do something to appease Jehovah. No, it's an issue of obeying the laws of the kingdom so that you can access. If you disobey, they take away your rights in the kingdom. They put you in the stocks. They give you, they, they lock you up in the stocks, in the jail, because you do not qualify to be on the street. But if you have paid your price there, they reinsert you in the street and you work your way up from being an ordinary citizen to become whoever you want to be, become a policeman, become a soldier, within those domains that you go of authority, you need to work yourself up the ranks. You get to rise up the ranks by performance, by doing things of the kingdom, not appeasing by obeying the law and doing your work. That's why Christ is saying, the kingdom of the Lord is like a man who gave his workers talents. They were expected to do what? To work and prove themselves. And after they prove themselves, they get what? Promotion. We don't we miss that. We think, no, we sing enough in the church and we give money in church and then we get to be promoted to become, you understand? It's an issue of obedience because Christ came to deal with disobedience issues and obedience qualifies you to rise up because a disobedient individual cannot be trusted with the business of Jehovah. You are a problem to be given responsibility. You are a problem to be given wealth because if you are a thief, then you'll be like Judah stealing from And the next thing is what? Betraying the son of the most high God by selling you, by doing stuff. So you need to be obedient and be qualified to do what's supposed to be done because of what you've done in service of the government that you save. We are supposed to so that's why Christ says, whoever wants to be greatest among you should be what? Should be one who saves what? Everybody else. Not who is saved by everybody else, but who saves everybody else. It's an issue of service to a government that we belong in. So that the government's authority gets to be extended wherever we are. And we're missing it. That's why we're in poverty, in sickness, because we don't understand what we're working with. We need to see to it that we operate as Job wants us to operate. So we are supposed to start thinking about the government that we serve. What are the laws of our government? We have the Bible that tells us the laws. How do you get to be rewarded for the service? If you honor your parents, then the king has more years on earth to you. That's service. If you are obedient to the king, then the king gets to give you a gift of service. Spiritual gifts of the Holy Spirit. Those are gifts of what? Of service. That promotion. That's power. Because if you don't have the gift 
of healing, you can heal people. You've been given authority over sickness and disease because of your obedience. That's promotion. We do not want to understand. That's why we are moving around looking for what? a man to do impartation. It's based on service. Are you qualified for the assignment? Are you qualified to handle wealth? You want to be a spiritual leader running a big church. But in your house, the kids and the dogs are fighting. You are fighting with your wife. You have no control. Within. How do you expect promotion from there? Because it's an issue of service. There is hierarchy there. The family is the, the basic organization of authority where the man has been given dominion in that family. Now, if you have been given dominion in that family and your wife is the one sitting on your head, you cannot be promoted to rule other men to have authority because you are unable to function within your smallest place of dominion. So we need to come to that part where we understand that we are in a kingdom and the kingdom principles are supposed to be what we benefit from. You see, we are also kind of challenged by the understanding of the kingdom principles. We have been in the, you know, uh, democracy. Democracy and, and kingdomship are different principles. Within a kingdom, the king is responsible for providing for the subject. That's why when they're in the desert, they're thirsty. Who provides the water? Jehovah. They are hungry. Who provides the food? Jehovah. They don't like the menu. Who changes the menu? Jehovah. And they want to go to war. Who provides the power and authority to go to war? The king. So we need to understand that this is how it works. When we see Jehovah interacting with the children of Israel, it was a government. That's why I find Jehovah would not talk to everybody except them that are in authority. He put a hierarchy. Him, Moses, Aaron, and Aaron's children, and then the tribe of Moses. That's already a hierarchy. That's, that's how it was said. And we need to understand that this is how it works. And if we read the Bible, let's read the Bible with the understanding that we are not in a religion, we are in a kingdom. These are rules that govern us in the kingdom. And the will of the king it should be what we are exercising in this kingdom. Glory be to God. For today we end this teaching here. Hopefully this teaching will continue where we get to understand more about the kingdom of heaven where we belong. Let us pray. Father Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for your love, your goodness, your mercy. Thank you for the waiting season, the waiting time, the word of empowerment that you've given us today, framing our minds for the power that you've given us, framing our minds to operate within the kingdom, having the dominion that you've given us in Jesus Christ's mighty name. As we go to sleep, Father, we ask for the protection of the kingdom to be upon us. May the enemy not have access to us, for we belong to you. We are the children of the Most High God in Jesus Christ's mighty name. Let's wake up tomorrow. We ask Jehovah to equip us, to empower us, to acquire wealth on behalf of the kingdom. For we know you are the one who gives us the authority and the power to acquire wealth. May you make us fruitful, Jehovah, bearing much fruit in you. Fruit that you like. Fruit that is in line with Christ in Jesus Christ's mighty name. We pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, here on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. In for Jesus Christ's mighty name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, my brothers and sisters, for coming to our prayer session today. We hope to see you tomorrow at the same time we will receive a wedding season, a wedding time, a word of empowerment. We love you so much. Good night and bye-bye.